Do you criticize others when they're not there? Do you spread stories about them to make them look bad when they're not around to defend themselves before you or before others whom you're making the charge against? If you're doing things like that without somebody else there so that that person can never defend themselves, you are by definition a slanderer. Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfelt. You're watching Back to the Bible Canada. I'm delighted to have you join us. I'm uh, taking off on a series I've begun about finding comfort in God. And uh, it's now today, we're looking at some of the Psalms. Um, and I'm looking today at Psalm 4, which is a prayer to be offered in the evening. You know, sometimes things look a lot better in the morning than they do in the evening. I remember years ago having a conversation with uh, with a man I'd come to know quite well. His wife had just recently died of cancer. And he said to me that during the day, he said, I, I'm okay, I'm holding myself together. Of course, I'm grieving, but I'm thinking I can go on. But at night, he said, it's before I go to sleep and the house is empty and I'm trying to get some sleep. And these dark thoughts overcome my soul. He said, I can hardly make it in the evening. And so the idea of having strong prayers at night uh, especially when some of our greatest fears assail us, is a very important theme that we find in the Bible. And Psalm 4 is written as a prayer of God's people at evening time. I mean, sometimes in the past, God's people not only met in the morning, but they met in the evening as well uh, to fill out a day. And so the evening prayers would be very important before God's people would go home and go to bed. Or you might think of people in the evening and uh, before they go to bed, kneeling down at their own bed and, uh, and offering prayers up to God. How do, we, how do we pray well at night, especially because some of us deal with nighttime as a very difficult time in our lives? So this, this psalm, Psalm 4, is about gaining security in the evening when the sun has set. And it teaches us how to pray at night. So Psalm 4, just like Psalm 3, has a heading to it. And if you have your Bible open, I hope you do, Psalm 4 begins with the words, to the choir master with stringed instruments, and then it simply adds a Psalm of David. So what you have at the beginning, unlike Psalm 3, the beginning of Psalm 4 simply has a musical notation. As you know, a great many of these psalms were written to have been sung. So not only are you saying your prayers, you're actually singing your prayers together and God's people are singing it. And so it simply has a new notation. This is to be played with stringed instruments and that's it. Of course, we don't know what it sounded like. We don't have, you know, in the Bible, the kind of a musical score the way that we have today. This is simply a notation that was there at the time that it was given. Now, if the evening seems oppressive to you, this psalm is written to help you sleep at night. For the godly preparation for sleep is always precious. Now, unlike Psalm 3, Psalm 3 begins by saying, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So it sets the context of the psalm, but Psalm 4 has no context that's given at all. However, However, I think that Psalm 3 and Psalm 4 basically form a compendium. So you've got a prayer for the morning, that's Psalm 3, and a prayer for the evening, which is Psalm 4. And it seems quite likely to me that the same historical setting is true for Psalm 4 as was true for Psalm 3. That is, David was fleeing as Absalom, his son, was leading a civil war and they were hunting down David to take his life. And so that's the idea behind it. There's a similarity between these two psalms. And there is a theme that we find in both of them. And so it seems likely that the same historical theme is there in both of them. So let's outline Psalm 4. I'm going to say, first of all, verse 1, which we're going to read in just a little while. That expresses the theme of the entire psalm. Then verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, that's the second section, verses 2 to 5, um, uh, speaks about, you know, what's the difference between the godly and the ungodly. And that we will see in just a little while is a very important theme. And then uh, the last part of it, verses 6 to 8, forms a wonderful conclusion to what we have here. So I think three, three parts are how we're going to study this psalm. So let's start Psalm 4 and begin by reading verse 1. This is an evening prayer. So verse 1 says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. 
You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. So let's uh, remember this historical background. If I'm right in understanding Psalm 4, as similar to Psalm 3, David is now fleeing. There is a civil war that's coming to the land, and there are people who are hunting down his life. You'll remember that when Absalom comes into Jerusalem and takes over, he tries to desecrate David's memory as best as possible, and he's got an advisor by the name of Ahithophel, and Ahithophel is saying, look, here's what you do. David's on the run. You want to go and send just a few men, go after him very quickly. He's an older man. Make sure you hunt him down, kill him on the spot, and uh, then the kingdom will be yours. So strike as fast as as you can. Now, that seemed like good counsel. But there was another man there, Hushai. He was actually a plant of King David. And Hushai is also known as a counselor. And so Hushai gives bad counsel. And in the end, Absalom, the son of David, who's leading this civil war, accepts this inferior counsel. What, what's the inferior counsel? Well, Hushai says, look, uh, David is a fighting man. And he's going to, he knows what it is to hide out in places. He's done that in the past. And uh, you've, you've got to understand that. And so what you wanted to do is you want to wait until you have all of Israel gathered together in this huge, massive army. And then you take on the army of David and, and then you defeat him. And then you're going to look like this great champion who's won the entire nation. So, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, there's all sorts of things behind that in terms of, you know, stressing ego and so forth. But the whole idea behind it is that Hushai's counsel is accepted and Absalom is going to mount a powerful army and they're going to wage war against David. So a great war is coming and everything is at stake now. And so this is an evening prayer that David gives. He says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. So David knows that immediately there's no one hunting his life right now, but eventually, eventually a great war is coming and people are saying you can't win. So he says, be gracious to me. Oh God, he's, he's making a plea. So this is an evening prayer when, you know, darkest thoughts come upon people and, you know, and David is praying. And so you might think, well, if David's praying this way, I wonder how, I wonder how his son Absalom and their men, are they praying as well? Well, in that day, almost everyone did pray. So you've got to think, well, yes, they're probably praying too. And maybe Absalom's men are praying like this. Oh God, give us victory over David so that the kingdom might slip from his grasp and so that his evil reign might be put to an end. So, you know, maybe that's how they're praying. And so you might say, well, who does God listen to? And that's sometimes a really important question that all of us ask, especially when we're being hard pressed and there are enemies who are seeking to undo us. You know, sometimes those enemies seem to have some kind of a faith as well. And we might ask ourselves, you know, I mean, who does God listen to in the end of the day? Now, notice how David begins here again. He says, oh, Lord, I'm, he says, I'm sorry, answer me when I call, O oh God of my righteousness. So God of my righteousness. Now, some people have suggested that this should be translated uh, as, oh, my righteous God. Now, that sounds very different because if David is saying, oh, my righteous God, he's stressing that God is whom we know him to be. That God is a righteous God. He does what is right. God is never morally compromised. You can't make a bargain with God. I'll do this for you if you do this for me. You know, God is never persuaded by anything outside of doing that which is righteous. He himself is the standard of righteousness. So we know that God is righteous. That's not in question here. But I think our translators have gotten this right. David's not saying, oh, righteous God. He's saying, oh, God of my righteousness. God who has created righteousness in me. See, that's what David is saying. In other words, David is saying, look, God, you authored righteousness in me. Now, I've already made the case that David is not arguing that he's sinless. From Psalm 3, uh, when we looked at that psalm, we saw that David is actually saying, look, I'm aware of my own sin. And I'm aware also that the sin that I have committed has brought some of this misfortune upon me. So David's not claiming to be sinless when he says that God is the author of my righteousness. But David does understand a couple of things. He understands that God has done something in his heart. God has done something that has called David to conform his ways to the ways of God. 
And this is what David is saying. Now, in the New Testament terminology, we call this regeneration. That is, when anyone comes to know Christ as personal Savior and Lord, God creates in us a new heart. That is, we have a heart that now rejoices in God and in his ways rather than in our own ways. I mean, we have a heart now that once we're born again that delights in the ways of God rather than rejects the way of God. I would say this, before we receive the new heart, we always not only hate the ways of God, we love our own ways and we always have in mind, I wanna get my portion in life. But when we come to Christ, it is because God has created a new heart in us and that God, that God is speaking to our heart to do that which is pleasing to the Lord. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Now, that passage does not say that when I am in Christ, I'm no longer tempted by sin. Of course I am. I also know that when I'm in Christ, I sometimes fall into sin. I know that's correct. But I know something has happened in me that had never happened in me before. And that thing is that God has created in me a heart that seeks after him. I may sin, but in the end of the day, the righteous person says, then I long to confess my sins and lay my case before God and ask, oh God, forgive me. See, that's the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. Go back to Psalm 1 and verse 1. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I mean, this whole idea behind that is that the new heart of the converted person finds God's word, his commands, his promises, the delight of his or her own soul. Now, if you don't have that, you need to come to know Christ. You need to be what is called in Scripture, born of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit creates something new in us. Listen to Psalm 66, verse 18, and it says something very similar. The psalm says, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. That is, if I'm you know, holding on to these sinful thoughts that are opposed to the way of God, God won't answer my prayer. See, that's why in the beginning of this psalm, look at it again. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. David is saying, I know you've created in me a heart that desires the law of God. I also know that those who oppose me at this juncture don't have those same desires, and I know that you answer the prayer of the righteous. See, again, let me read from Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. I tell you this, that if we continue to live in sin and refuse to repent, we are gonna find that our prayers are hindered and we're gonna end up praying for things that are not righteous and not within the will of God and we will find God not responding to the prayers of those things which are wicked in his sight. So David's not saying, I'm taking credit for my righteousness. He's rather saying, God has given me a new heart and I long for his ways. And I think that's how all of our praying needs to begin. You know, I say to you again, that if you long for the things of God, it's because God has created that longing. If you don't have that longing, it's because you've never received the new heart and you've never been born again. So that's how David starts Psalm 4. God, you have, through your mercy, brought about a change in my heart, he's saying, so that I love your righteousness now, and because of that, I'm calling to you. Be gracious to me, have mercy on me, and listen to my prayer. I wrote this in my notes. You know, that's an evening prayer. The shadows are growing long. The sun is setting. The darkness is settling in. The threats that David feels are ever present and they are real threats, not imagined threats. And the night has made those threats ever more ominous to him. And that's how David comes before God. He's recognizing that this is a relevant prayer to pray in the evening and it is for us. You know, I'm gonna say this, that you know, if you're at a place where you're kind of afraid to fall asleep at night because of restless thoughts, you begin that way. You say, God, I'm gonna to come to you because you have created in me a desire to do your will. And when I pray, I wanna pray within the will of God. And I know that when I pray within the will of God, you are there to hear my prayers. 
And so that gives a great sense of comfort that God will not turn a deaf ear to the prayers of his people. So pray at night knowing that God hears you. So that's the theme, and we find that in verse 1. And so now we go from verses 2 to verse 5, in which David wants to make clear the difference between the godly and the ungodly. So let's read verses 2 to 5. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices. Put your trust in the Lord. Now, there's a lot in that, so let's take the time and unpack this. I want you to notice two descriptors here of the ungodly. Here's the first. The ungodly, how long will my honor be turned into shame? I'll tell you what that's called. It's called slander. And there's something of a mark of an ungodly person is that they seek to slander someone else. I mean, slander is a very effective tool. I mean, it is indeed what uh, was used against David to start the civil war. I mean, his son was saying, you know, David won't listen to you. David doesn't even care about you, but I care about you. I mean, that was Absalom's word to all of Israel, and he kept repeating it and had other people repeat it until people began to believe it. And people say, well, I've heard the same thing because slanderers know how to spread slander until everyone's heard it, and then everything that's slanderous gets repeated. See, here's a question that I want to ask you because it's a distinction between the godly and the ungodly. The ungodly are slanderers, and the question I want to ask you, are you, my dear listener, right now, are you a slanderer? Do you criticize others when they're not there? Do you spread stories about them to make them look bad when they're not around to defend themselves before you or before others whom you're making the charge against? If you're doing things like that without somebody else there so that that person can never defend themselves, you are by definition a slanderer. I want to let you know that this is what was used effectively against Jesus by the Pharisees who eventually nailed him to a cross. So don't delay. If you're a slanderer, you repent before God. Lay your case before him and say, God, I've done that which is evil in your sight, and I seek in the future not to speak this way about others. You see, that's what Psalm 4 helps us to do. It helps us not to be habitual in slandering. We need to repent and not repeat the behavior. The second thing that I notice here is that David also says, how long will you love words of vanity and words of lies? See, vanity is interesting because not only do we have uh, the wicked slandering someone else and spreading stories about them to make them look as, as bad as possible, but we find the motivation is their own vanity. That is, they seek to make themselves look good in comparison to the others. And that's what Absalom did. I mean, everyone that came to Jerusalem, Absalom would say, well, David's not going to listen to you. But I, if I were the king, I would certainly listen to you. He was saying, I'm so much better than the person that I'm criticizing. Oh, my goodness. And that was what Absalom was like. Defamation of David was not in the heat of anger. It was repeated, it was habitual, it was ongoing, it was never ceasing, it was influencing more and more people until it succeeded in driving David out of Jerusalem. And it all came because Absalom was in love with himself and he loved the idea that he was better than the next guy. You know, there are some that have used defamation to throw pastors out of congregations. There are others have had their business partner removed or a competitor destroyed in the same means. Still others have used it against their spouse, against their parents, against their adult children, against still others, and they have brought great harm to churches, to families, among friends, and among businesses. It arises out of a love to triumph over another by vanquishing them through defamation. I have known individuals who have lived their lives consistently like this, and many in their wake have fallen because of their use of this effective technique. See, 
uh, we need to do something, especially uh, those of you, you know, those of us um, who who want to live righteously. Let me suggest this: when somebody is slandering in your presence, first thing that you need to know when somebody begins to criticize, you need to say, "Listen, that person isn't here right now. Can I call him right now?" Can we set up a meeting where all three of us are present? I want to say that the minute you talk that kind of language, rather than listening and saying, "Uh uh uh-huh, uh-huh, I know, I know. Instead of talking that way, say, I'm going to call that person. I want them to be here while you're saying what you're saying about them. And the minute you make that a pattern in your speech, I'm going to tell you the slander ends very quickly. Slander always works in the darkness. It always works when others aren't challenging it and when people are simply listening. Again, the call is there to repent. So David is contrasting the slanderer with the godly. The Lord sets apart the godly for himself. Look again at verse 3. But, O Lord, I'm sorry, (laughs) in verse 3 here it says, But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call. See, and so David is saying, you know, I know this. I'm not going to participate in that. And the Lord is going to listen to me. And then we come to verse 4, which says, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. Now, you might wonder how verse 4 works here. Let me read it again. I mean, here's the slander being offered and David saying, I know that God will protect me. And then he says, Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. The real question here is, who's being addressed here? Is the slanderer being addressed? And there are some people that say, yeah, it's the slander because they will argue that we should translate the words be angry as tremble. So the word to the slander is start trembling and do not sin. Now that's one way of translating those words, but I don't think that's right. I think that verse 4 is directed towards the righteous. What do you do when people are slandering you? And so, you know, and uh, and so the answer is be angry and do not sin. You know, what's fascinating to me is that Paul quotes this very word in Ephesians 4, verse 26, when he writes, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Isn't that interesting? Paul quotes this very passage. See, this verse is directed at believers. It's directed at the righteous. What if you're the one being slandered? When you're being slandered, be angry. Of course you're going to be angry because it's unrighteous to be treated that way. It's not wrong to say these things were said when I wasn't there. One person met after another after another, and these things were said about me. I had no opportunity to defend myself in any case. They all heard one side of the story. I didn't realize what was going on until it finally came to my ears, and by that time, it had become a huge issue, and I found that my reputation had been destroyed without even a thought that I could answer. See, some of us have gone through stuff like that, and we've wondered what exactly to say if that's the case. Of course we're going to have an inner anger, but how do you stop an inner anger from becoming a sinful anger? See, be angry and do not sin. See, in other words, what does sin look like? Well, sin looks like bitterness in the heart. I mean, we've all met the individual who's got this inner rage that never goes away. And in the inner age, we begin to contemplate what might be done to those who have so abused us. Uh, We might think even plotting revenge. And we might think, I'm going to start my own slander campaign against them. And so you, in that sense, um, have to, you know, get into the mud with them and fight, you know, as we say, fire with fire. And so, you know, we're slandering back and we become as evil as the original slanderer. I mean, it is possible for an individual to be slandered and they're righteous, they become angry, and out of that a deep settled rage develops and they become deeply lost in sin. I'm going to say this, the devil delights in that kind of stuff. He does. He wants us, when we have been mistreated, to become deeply, innerly affected so that we're no longer able to, to, to react as biblical and Christ-like men or women. So David wants to ponder the, the thing that was done, but he doesn't want to sin. 
So look at verse five. So it says, um, well, I'll read verse four again. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own heart on your beds and be silent. I mean, there is a time when you don't speak. You come to terms with what was done, but you offer nothing to anyone. You're just simply silent and you're thinking the matter through. And then we come to verse five, offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. So let's take those two things one at a time. First, offer right sacrifices. What does it mean? It means that we have set the original wrong before God in worship and we make sure that our own slate is clean before God. We're not entering into the sin itself. Therefore, before God, we should remember the promises that he has made. So for instance, Psalm 94. 12 to 15, blessed is the man whom you discipline, O Lord, and whom you teach out of your law to give him rest from the days of trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not forsake his people. He will not abandon his heritage for justice will return to the righteous and all the upright in heart will follow it. So notice what it's been saying here in this Psalm. First of all, it might be that we look upon what's happening to us and say, well, this is the discipline of the Lord. Now, don't misunderstand what I've just said. It doesn't mean that God is now punishing me for something. It's not that. It's that God is is training me to be more Christ-like. And please remember this. If you're being slandered, do you know that you have a savior who was also slandered? What do you think he went through? What it was like for Jesus, for all the evil that was said against him to finally to have led to the cross and the crucifixion. How did that feel for your savior? I mean, one of the points of discipline that we have in becoming more and more like Christ is experiencing the world through the eyes of Christ. If you're being slandered, remember Christ who was also slandered and identify with him and come to love him more for he could have ended all slander. Unlike you, you can't, but he could have and chose not to so that he could be your savior and die for your sins. And because of that, you could enter more deeply into the sufferings of Jesus and remember what a sacrifice that he made for you. He was slandered for your sake so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ. This is how much he loved you. Let that thought discipline you, train you in righteousness. Learn from the slander and think about your savior. That's a marvelous lesson. That's the first thing that we can do. You ponder that on your bed. You think about Jesus, that's what we do. And the other thing that we also find here is this promise in Psalm 94 that the Lord will not forsake his own people. In the end of the day, God won't abandon you. Yes, it may go bad with you for a time period, but God will not forsake you. He's not gonna leave you lying on the side of the road, bleeding and damaged, and simply walk away from you and never remember you again. You are God's own, you belong to him. He paid for you with a price of the blood of his son to make you his own and adopted you into his family. He will never forsake his own. You remember that at those times and hold tightly to the fact that the one whose opinion matters the most, the God who loves you and sent his son for you, that opinion matters the most. Remember that even though everyone else forsake you, he will not. What a wonderful thought that is. Ponder that on your bed. When you're praying at night, think about that. Recall the promises that God has said to you. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word to you will never pass away. Ponder that. Take it deeply in your heart. Let that disciple you and discipline you. Then David adds, put your trust in the Lord. Place your eyes upon God. Count on his faithfulness, settle your heart down, knowing that God will never make a promise to you that he will not fulfill. Well, sometimes I know it's a long wait. Sometimes it seems like, I mean, the slander seems to be winning for a long period of time, and I know that. But please also understand, and that's what's here. You know, um, you know, you offer right sacrifices, you simply put your trust in the Lord, and that's how you do it. Now, I've said that there are three parts to this. Uh, verse one is simply the theme. Verses two all the way to verse five, that has to do with, uh, you know, with a distinction between the righteous and the unrighteous. The unrighteous are slanderers, the righteous are not. The righteous put their hope in the Lord. The unrighteous put their hope in their, their own word and being able to pull others down and pull themselves up. That's a distinction between the two. 
Now, here we come now to the conclusion, and that's the third part. And these are faithful words from God, and I'm reading verses 6, 7, and 8. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face toward us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than when their grain, that is the unrighteous grain and wine, abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now, there's a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. Notice how David says in verse 7, you have put more joy in my heart. In other words, as I've meditated on you in the midst of this very difficult situation, I am finding that I'm finding joy in Christ. You know, I know David did not yet know Jesus, but he had the hope of the Messiah. He had the hope that God would redeem him. He had the hope that God's promises would not fail. Those were the hope that David had. We have a greater hope than David, and we can do that too. We can think about what God has promised us and the delight that he has prepared for us. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can still find joy and delight in our God. We can settle this matter. I'd rather have Christ than the well thoughts of a multitude. I'd rather have his smile upon me than the smile of a multitude. Even if the multitude frown and God smiles, it's good enough and there's where my joy lies. See, that's the first thing. And then notice the second thing it says, you've put more joy in my heart than they have, speaking of the unrighteous, when their grain and new wine abound. So, you know, clearly the unrighteous, I mean, they're doing well for themselves. <laughs> you, know, not, you know, I don't know whether either they're wealthy or everything else is turning out rosy for them. For a period of time, it always looks like the unrighteous are winning. That's a fact. You can't deny that. We know that from the cross. The unrighteous clapped their hands and they, you know, they congratulated themselves when they had finally crucified Jesus and he was laid in a tomb. But as you and I know, that's not the end of the story. You see, there is a time when their grain and new wine abound, but that's okay. David ends by saying, in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So putting all of these thoughts together, knowing that God cares for me, knowing that his promises will in the end of the day win out, knowing that God's hand will never cease in my life, and knowing that the wicked will in the end not get away with anything, I simply content myself in this. This has been my prayer in the evening as I go to sleep. And having now contented myself in God and looking at his promises, I find myself restful, my eyes close, and I go to sleep, and I am at peace. May the peace of God be yours. If you fear the night, if you fear what you might think about and how your restless mind might keep you awake, might I suggest going back to this very precious psalm, Psalm chapter 4, and read it again, and let it be your guide as you pray before the Lord. And when it's all over, may God grant you what you need the most, a good night's sleep, knowing that God's faithfulness is true. Thanks for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada today. Always delighted that we can do Bible study together, remind ourselves of the promises of God, and be at peace with Him. May the Lord bless you on this day, and may He bless you this evening as well. Amen. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.